Hello, and welcome to this film, which is all about stoichiometry again, but this time it involves gases. So we're going to be looking at chemical reactions that have gases in them, and we're going to be trying to combine our knowledge of the gas laws, which we've looked at in the last couple of films, with our knowledge of stoichiometry from previous films. So it'd be good if you've um, watched those films and understood them before you watch this one. Okay? And also, we might see if there's a shortcut at the end of this film for reactions that are taking place at constant temperature and pressure, as opposed to standard, although it could be standard, but where the temperature and pressure don't change, we might be able to use Avogadro's law as a little shortcut in our calculations. Right, let's start off with an example that, as it happens, doesn't involve Avogadro's law. We're being asked here, what is the theoretical volume of carbon dioxide that will form a STP if 25 grams of calcium carbonate is decomposed? Here's our calcium carbonate. We've got 25 grams of that. We're being asked about the volume of carbon dioxide. We're being told that we're at STP, so that's 101 kilopascals and 273 Kelvin, which remember is the same as 0 degrees centigrade, but we're not going to use degrees centigrade in these calculations. And we're being asked the theoretical volume. So what's the most carbon dioxide that I could possibly make if I started with that much calcium carbonate and decomposed it? Okay, well, let's first of all, let's write a formula for the thing that I'm being asked to find. You should remember that the ideal gas law, or one way of putting it, is to say that PV equals NRT. So another way that you could write the ideal gas law is that the volume equals NRT over P. Do we know all these quantities? Well, I know the pressure, I know the temperature, I know the gas constant, that's 8.31. All I need to know is the number of moles of carbon dioxide. I don't know that, but it's related to the number of moles of calcium carbonate. So if I can find the number of moles of calcium carbonate, I can plug that into here, and I'm away. However, I might consider it easier, seeing as I'm at STP, to use the molar volume of a gas, because I know that the molar volume of a gas at STP is 22.4 dm cubed for every mole of gas. Okay? So, if that's the case, then the volume of gas that I'll collect at STP will be the number of moles multiplied by the molar volume. And you might decide that because this involves less steps and less calculating that you might be a good idea really to use that method in an exam because it's going to take you less time. So I know the molar volume, I don't know the number of moles yet, I know that the number of moles of carbon dioxide is somehow related to the number of moles of calcium carbonate. Is it as simple a relationship as what I've just written? Well let's look at the balanced equation, there's one of this to every one of that, so yes this is true. So I can find the number of moles of carbon dioxide by finding the number of moles of calcium carbonate. The number of moles is equal to the mass divided by the molar mass. To hold the mass of calcium carbonate, so this would be a good formula to use. And this is going to be 25 over 100.09. leave you to check that if you like. Okay, But you should be able to find the molar mass of calcium carbonate pretty easily by now. And I've only got two significant figures here, so I'm going to give this to two significant figures. That's 0.25 moles. I now know the number of moles here, that's 0.25, multiply that by 22.4, and I find that that's 5.6 dm cubed. Once again, I'm giving my answer to two significant figures, because my least precise piece of data was only to two significant figures. My temperature and pressure were both to three. Okay, so there's a fairly simple stoichiometry, stoichiometry problem. Here's a slightly more complex one. We might be looking at this and thinking, oh, there's a sign here. Look, I'm being given the amount of one substance and of another. That might be making me think, oh, that's a limiting reagent question. So here's my octane. Here's my oxygen. And in actual fact, this is we're imagining this is what's going on in a car engine. A spark is supplied. Assuming the temperature and pressure do not change, so in other words, the temperature and pressure that the gases are mixed at is the same as the temperature and pressure that they escape from the cylinder at. What is the final volume of the exhaust gases? Right, fairly tricky question, because what I've got to do here is I've got to find the volume of carbon dioxide and the volume of water that form, add them together, because they're all going to be in the exhaust, and if one of these is limiting, then the other one is in excess, so I'm going to have some left over. So I've got to add up all the volumes of the gases that are left at the end. That could be the carbon dioxide, the water, 
and whichever one of these two is in excess. Now once again, I could write a formula for the thing that I'm asked to find. That would be V equals NRT on P, according to the ideal gas law. Okay, And I could find the number of moles of every one of these gases that I'm interested in, multiplied by the gas and so on and so forth. Right? Or I can use Avogadro's law here as a bit of a shortcut, because I know that the volume is proportional to the number of moles. So what that means is the mole ratio in this equation is the same as the volume ratio. I can only do this because the temperature and pressure haven't changed. Okay, so at constant temperature and pressure, volume is proportional to the number of moles, so the mole ratio will be the same as the volume ratio. Okay, so if I had 20 centimeters cubed of octane, I would need 12 and a half times that amount, or in other words, 250 centimeters cubed of oxygen. So clearly, because I've got 300, this is in excess, this is the limiting reagent, and I'm going to base the number of moles of exhaust gases on the number of moles of octane that I've got. If you wanted to do that the other way that I showed you earlier in the previous film, you could say that the actual volume is 20 over 300, and I've put the octane on top there. The ideal volume is 2 over 25. 20 over 300 is uh, 1 15th. This is 1 12 and a half. Okay, and 1 12 and a half is greater than 1 15th. So in other words, this number is too small to make this ratio as big as the ideal ratio. So the octane is my limiting reagent. So it doesn't matter how you find the limiting reagent as long as you can do it reliably. Now, if the limiting reagent, which is 20 centimeters cubed, is going to use 250 centimeters cubed of oxygen, then there are going to be 50 centimeters cubed of it left. But I'm also going to produce eight times because I've got 16 moles of CO2 to every two of octane, so eight times that amount, 160 centimeters cubed of carbon dioxide. And 180 centimeters cubed, you can figure that out for yourself, hopefully, of water. So the exhaust gases are going to contain all three of these gases, and hopefully we can see that that's 390 centimeters cubed. Okay? So we've seen there, in that last example, a way that we can shortcut the kind of calculating things using the ideal gas law, using Avogadro's law. We won't always be able to do that because the conditions won't always be the same. Um, but hopefully we've got a few tools now to attempt some of these problems. It's absolutely crucial that you practice some of these things so that you actually learn how to do them. Seeing me do a couple of examples might hopefully make you understand how to do them, but it's not going to teach you how to do them. Um, so if you've got any questions, ask as soon as you can. Come and see me if you like or post a question on YouTube.